All right, we're going to go ahead and move on. Had a great first presentation from Jason, and hopefully you were able to uh, get some ideas and thoughts. One of the great things about a day like today is just an opportunity to collaborate with other people in the same positions you are. So we're excited to offer this foreign language tick today. Our next presenter is Joe Salen from Boone High School. He is currently teaching just ninth grade Spanish one. Uh, he is in a one-to-one -one district. Uh, he has had access to iPads in the classroom the last few years, and this year they just transitioned to Chromebooks. So if you are in a similar situation, he might be someone to speak to. So we're excited to hear what he has to share today, and I'll turn it over to him. I got, okay, yeah, I've got this. That's right. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm Joe Salen. Uh, a little bit of background on me. I grew up in the southeast part of the state. Anybody here have connections to the southeast corner of the state? Yeah, centrally. Absolutely. Yeah, she taught. Yeah, hey, Lacey. She taught my, uh, my, my high school age brother here a few years ago. So um, anyway, I went to college, Truman State. I was an Iowa fan my whole life growing up. And then I was a trader. And now I find myself like going to my first Iowa State game this coming Saturday, the Kansas and Iowa State game. So I'm not really sure what I'm a fan of anymore. I'm just glad to be back in Iowa. So uh, this is my third year teaching at Boone. And the first two years, I was Spanish one and two and shared that with another teacher. And now we've got a freshman academy that's separating freshmen completely uh, uh, from the rest of the school. And I am the Spanish one teacher. So I do have a few upperclassmen because there wasn't enough to have like a dedicated Spanish one for upperclassmen. But for the most part, I deal with uh, freshmen. So um, basically, when I got to Boone, I, I, it was the first time I was going to have devices in in our classroom and I started with a one-to-one -one iPad cart and uh, it was actually Travis was uh, the person that was meeting with us at, at sort of like meeting with our Spanish PLC from time to time uh, and he introduced me to this program called Nearpod and at that point I was looking for a way to um, integrate more technology in my classroom and also find a way for my teaching style to become more tech integrated so uh, I really enjoyed what I saw with the program, and it's developed a lot since I even kind of jumped on board. Uh, I'm not getting paid by them at all to, to give this presentation. So um, I started with the free trial, and because I liked it, I ended up going to like where I actually, uh, it's like a $10 a month thing that I, that I just use the like instructional funds every year for. I mean, I think that I save more than that in markers probably, and, and other things, because most it makes everything pretty much paperless. So. Um, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and have a couple of different things that you guys can do here, and I'll let you guys decide what you want, because uh, you can set up Nearpod presentations where students can work at their own pace, or you can kind of have it where the, the teacher is, is instructing students and, and basically manipulating what slides they're looking at. So I'll let you guys, and you can jump back and forth in between them, but to get us started, you're going to have to go to nearpod.com, which I will write up here. And if you can see on my screen, this is like all the different presentations I do. So the, we're, now that I'm in Spanish one, these are kind of like all the daily presentations that I make and manipulate and add to. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up the first one where you'll be on the screen that I, the slide that I am on. And so this will be your Nearpod code. You can see it up there on the board, but I'm going to go ahead and write the, um, I just write the first one up here. And then the one that'll be at your own pace. I just click that homework button and it makes it at, at your own pace. So you can kind of go through and explore. I would just like to, I, I'm kind of a hoarder technology wise. Is anybody else in here a technology hoarder where, where when you make files, you just kind of make, keep adding them to existing presentations. And, and uh, uh, so the disclaimer is about the first 25 slides or so are ones I actually intend for you to look at. After that, it just, you kind of start getting into like, like the deep net. Um, so if you're, if you're using this one, you can kind of just go through and be looking at what type of stuff I've made for this. I try, what I try to do is make this presentation one that's um, 
kind of showcased all the features. Ones, even ones that I'm that I'm don't use very much because they're fairly new, or ones that I just find didn't really that I that I didn't really integrate all too much. So we'll go ahead and go to the first presentation. So when you guys get logged in, if you see up here on my screen what I'm looking at on the board, I've got like the teacher view. And one thing I can do is I can click here and I can see that there's 18 people that are looking at this and Jordan and Kelsey have decided that they're not going to watch this right now. They have logged in and they have logged off. Thanks Jordan, thanks Kelsey. <laughs> so it's kind of one of those ways that you can uh, gauge what people, because everybody's staring at a device and sometimes you're sitting there in the room and, and you don't know what they're looking at. So this kind of helps out with, uh, thanks Jordan, he's back. Kelsey still hates me. So the, First thing you can do is just set up a slide. I mean, it's like PowerPoint, basically, except kids can, uh, depending on the device, um, I find that, does anybody here have iPads? iPads, iPads in your room? Okay, a few people. I started with iPads, and the thing I thought was fun was that you can actually like manipulate with tactile, be able to like zoom in and zoom out. And one thing that I started doing was um, like we would have, maybe I'd show a slide like this, and we would maybe play like hand twister with our iPads. So so you'd have kids like trying to, to get all of their fingers on the different countries as I would say them and it would kind of help them learn geography that way and I just get to make them mangle their hands and there's, I, we developed different sort of versions of that so that's, but uh, that's one thing that the iPads have. I'm, I'm finding other ways to kind of use now that we're on Chromebooks, I don't, I don't play that game anymore but um, with Chromebooks you can still have kids like manipulate and, and just hover over whatever it is that you're looking at. So. Um, the first thing you do is just have a slide and then um, kind of present information that way. And um, so like you can have like sort of quizzes as you're going. You can present things if you're, if you're on the one that I, the, this top one right now, you'll notice that you can like slide up and down through all the different slides so you can actually make a slideshow. Uh, one of the uses I used for this was to make uh, embedded readings for a uh, novel that we've read. Has anybody in here tried to do like language learner novels at all in class? Like any of those, like I know Pobreana is the one a lot of people think of, but like I've got a few other ones that I enjoy a little bit more. There's one that's like Agente Secreto y el Mural de Picasso. Anybody, if you're familiar with that one, I've made uh, embedded readings that, um, and the reason that this works well for that is because it's a whole slideshow. So I can be kind of manipulating. Most of the time what I do in class is have students working at the same slides that I'm at and then I'll be able to put like 10 slides on so that way the kids that decide to do the easier ones, they've got just, you know, the, nobody knows which ones they're doing. They're just reading the, the first few slides, which will be the easier version, and then they get to like version two, which will be the next few slides. So this one is just set up to have all of the content uh, from, I guess, like our, our vocabulary list for our first chapter. Does anybody in here use Avancemos, Capitulo Preliminar? Yeah, we just got done with our assessment over that. So, um, Anyway, there's a slideshow is one of the things you can do. Uh, this is another thing, trying to teach kids how to read that we first went over and, and then to show you guys the next thing you can do with this is just like basically replacing paper in many ways in the classroom. Um, for this particular thing, you're not being able to see what I'm looking at on the board, but if you're following along with what I'm doing here, I guess I could get this up on my iPad. All right, so I mean, just having kids like be able to draw on on this, and and uh, that you can also write with text boxes. So it it basically, like I said, replaces um, paper. They can use highlighters. Um, yeah, there's and you can also actually add uh, photos from your camera, which I actually learned because of students inserting selfies into pick yeah so um, but yeah actually having them answer with selfies and stuff is something that you can do especially I mean all of us I think can the selfie is pretty inspiring to our to the kids that we teach so um, they can actually take a picture or they can uh, upload a picture from online um, there's a lot of different things that you can do with that but that's like the drawing tool that they that they have for one of the things um, Here's another way that I used the drawing tool was to, uh, we'll be back on the iPad, do I need to, okay. So I just had them all, you know, like, just like you would do with paper, I had them all write letters and then I started calling them off to try to learn the alphabet here. And 
and uh, you can do you can use like different colors to be able to do more bingo stuff. I mean, a lot of these, I, I think, guys, I'm giving you guys some examples, and I think hopefully you'll be able to think of how you could use that same sort of tool. There's nothing, I think, too revolutionary about what anything I've said so far, just that it, it does, for me, what it was really great for was like um, accessibility, organizing. You can have kids where they can just type. So I've done dictations here recently where they were just typing um, exactly what they could hear. The, that's one thing. And then, um, and th this is where I really think that Nearpod was, was great for my class. Has anybody in here used something like Socrative or have you ever used that before? Okay, so Socrative is a great thing for like formative assessments and I find that like everything gets kind of collected together in Nearpod so I can have you guys all take this wonderful five question quiz and um, maybe you should, some, somebody in here intentionally answer some questions wrong. Go ahead guys and try to take that because you'll be able to see what I see as a teacher. Um, so you can see like, and I, and I asked for intentional wrong answers for a reason. Uh, you can see that this, this circle right here tells me how my entire class is doing. And then also I can see there are different answers. So I can see, you know, is whatever, whatever uh, target we're trying to cover for each of the different questions, which one is it that I need to cover? So it's uh, formative assessments are really getting pushed right now hard at my school. Anybody else here trying to, yeah, formative assessments where they're trying to do something every single day. And so this is one way that I integrated that um, every single day. So. And then um, I'll go ahead and see once a couple people get done, I'm going to click the share button because it, you can immediately see how you've done. So anybody who is taking that quiz right now, some people probably have some sections of yellow from ones that you didn't answer, but it just kind of shows kids immediately how they did. You can press the button at the bottom of the screen if you're on like, like my iPad right here. Um, and I, of course, I was a slacker and didn't answer anything, but if I click this, my answers at the bottom of the screen, I can circle through and see, you know, what were the right answers and what were my answers. So I think for formative assessment is one thing that has really been helpful. Um, another thing that you can do, and this is something, I mean, you're probably using technology to direct students to outside websites. This is just a way where it's kind of like, I mean, we all get that feeling sometimes, like especially with technology, that we're hurting cats. And this is a way that I found that uh, where I can see, you know, that all my students are looking at this website. And in this case, this was, I think this is weather.com Spanish site. So, and we've done some examination with that to see what, um, you know, what type. There's some vocabulary that's not covered in the textbook that, that, that I think they were able to kind of glean from what they were looking at. And a lot of things that were covered in the textbook that they were able to see used in an actual, like, contextual situation. So on mine it just shows website and I think sometimes I thought you could actually for the teacher version I think you can click on it. Yeah I can click on it right there and then it'll just open it in a new tab for me. So this is what you guys are looking at. And I had uh, I had all the students like look up their favorite location um, and we figured out that unfortunately weather.com does not post Antarctica's hourly forecasts. <laughs> but there's all kinds of things. I mean you know just linking up to other websites that you can do and it's something you can kind of organize within this sort of you know like like I like to think of it sort of like PowerPoint on steroids. Um, you can have people answer a poll. What type of weather do you guys like? Let's figure it out. So if you answer this, this um, poll, be able to see what we think as a class in terms of who likes what. So, and I can actually share that all with you as a poll response. So, and how many any people in here use like those poll any is it poll anywhere or something? Yeah, there's like all kinds of things, and they're all like little separate things. I find that what Nearpod does isn't anything new so much as just organize a lot of other features I liked in other websites, and that's why I found it to be somewhere where I could like organize that and then have like actual lessons planned out that I didn't have to you know go through and and uh, remake every single time. Um, it was better than the than the the word documents that used to be my lessons, I guess. So. Um, so I'll go ahead and share so you guys can see, you know, what is our class response to weather? What do we think? Me gusta cuando hace sol. So I'd say that that's uh, not surprised at all by that. This has been a really nice September, hasn't it? So um, some new features that I, or I, I have them do communicative activities with this. 
So like I had them, and this is something you could easily do on a piece of paper, but I just find that like uh, that that what Nearpod does, it breaks it up into little chunks. So instead of doing a worksheet, they're now doing like individualized, you know, like little activities. And that keeps seems to ki keep kids a little bit more motivated because when they see the whole worksheet, they're like, I gotta do both sides of this. Has anybody ever been at the whole thing? And with Nearpod, it's like you just have this little chunk that you're doing at a time and then, you know, reset. And, and it's really helped with motivation that I used to deal with. Um, with this one, it's just a matter of, of they've got the tool to click on. If you notice, if you're on the, the iPad here, let's get switched over to the iPad. Then if I click, oops, if I click on this, unplug, replug, or, okay. If I click on that, I can see all the vocabulary that we've, that we've learned. So that way, what I used to have is I would, I would have a communicative activity, have kids moving around the room, and then you'd get kids that just, you know, were like, I don't remember this stuff. And so it's like, here it is. Here it is. I expect you to use Spanish. We're going to avoid English. And this is the way that, that uh, you know, guarantee that even the lowest performer in class is held accountable. Um, so they just would, I would have kids write their, their names and then where their hometown is from um, on this particular activity. And then when they send it in to me, it's really quick. I can just kind of like look down the whole list and can see, you know, that everybody's done it. Because if you guys see right here, um, Maria es de bueno. Um, and you can see like when people answer it that like, like they're, and I, I, I apologize, everybody, writing with a mouse is hideous. Nobody's going to judge your handwriting. No, no teacher should ever judge your handwriting that you can do with a mouse or with your finger on an iPad. It's Kind of hilarious, actually. But it'll organize everybody so I can see, you know, who's done and who am I still awaiting a drawing from. When I go through at the end of the day to check and see, you know, like for, for a participation grade, if anybody else gives those, I can just see, you know, if people completed the activities or if they didn't. The only issue is when people try to write with a bright green text on a yellow background. That is impossible to see. Um, that's one of the ways I've been using it. Uh, this is something new. Just look at it. I, 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 don't, I don't know. I, I looked at it, and I was like, wow, this is, this is interesting. Um, and I think what it is is it's just like a 360-degree camera, and I, I chose Machu Picchu because I've always wanted to go there. Um, but if you're on, on your computers, or if I'm looking like here at my iPad, I can see like everything from Machu Picchu. So I guess like a 360-degree camera. Uh, and you know, I'll stop it there for anybody who already feels sick. <laughs> Wait, oh, 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 discovery. That's why it kept moving. So, yeah, I knew that. I knew that. I knew it did that. Um, another thing you can do, does anybody use social media to get kids trying to, like, you know, like Twitter? Um, I have this hooked up now to my Twitter timeline. Uh, you could easily have a class Twitter in which people are going to be posting onto that class Twitter with different, I, and I see this as being maybe a little bit more advanced than one month into Spanish, Spanish one kids. At this point, it's pretty much bien malo, mas o menos. But uh, once you get a little bit past that, maybe into Spanish, for Spanish too, you see a lot more uses for it. And I just, I foresee, Nearpod seems to be adding features. I foresee them doing, doing things where they're adding more, I mean, has anybody started using like Snapchat in class at all, like with the Snapchat timelines and the different histories around? I, there's no, there's nothing currently, but that's one of the directions I could just see them going with this. Uh, but that's you know a totally separate thing. Snapchat, where there's there's a lot of really cool stuff um, culturally, learning a lot about like uh, I just wasn't it recently that Costa Rica's Independence Day. Did anybody check out that stuff? So um, my wife is really into Snapchat, and she usually f finds these things for me. Um, and really, I think one of the last uh, one of the last things, if you if you work on vocabulary, which I mean that's kind of one thing I think everybody in here at least at one point is going to be working on vocabulary, you can have them do uh, fill in the blank type activities, where you'll have a word bank and then they drag the words, so you can see what's going on, on the iPad. Um, Almost. I remember this entire thing because I had to watch it like 500 times when I watched the YouTube video for it. <coughs> Yay. 
I win. So um, you can do that with, with uh, vocabulary. And really, I think the rest of my presentation is, on, on Nearpod specifically is pretty much like I, I wanted to accentuate some of the features I use. One of the things that's not on this, um, you can upload videos, you can upload audio. Videos make for a huge presentation that must be downloaded. So I would really recommend instead that you just like posted a link to the YouTube video and then just had, you know, I, I don't know, like have like one kid in every three keep their computer open, go to the YouTube video and watch a YouTube video as opposed to like downloading a video and posting it to the Nearpod thing. One thing I did use this for though was for our listening assessment. Um, you could actually upload audio tracks into a Nearpod presentation and then kids can actually like pause that on their own. Um, does anybody here use that, that you still use like the disc and then play it like three times for the whole class and keep going? Yeah, this, this one helps kids be able to like, you know, pinpoint the part that they're not understanding and uh, they can all kind of work at their own pace with headphones. So um, for listening assessments, I found that it's, it's really de-stressed a lot of, and, and there's a lot less frustration I've noticed. And I've also noticed that, that it just goes up when, when kids can kind of pinpoint the one sound and listen to it over and over and over on their own, as opposed to having to wait for the entire class to listen to the disc. So um, posting those is, is not very difficult on Nearpod. I've got um, my listening assessment that I just did, actually. I can go ahead and kind of show you guys a live session here. Finish one. And yeah, there, this is now playing audio, but you don't have to be able to hear this. This is just, uh, I was pretty, pretty sick when I did this too, so I'm feeling much better. But um, it was just a conversation that I had with the other Spanish teacher, and then we recorded it. Um, and then they were actually filling out a p paper and pencil uh, test, so just a way to post listening assessments. Um, so that, that entire presentation, though, was the, was the test. It was like the listening test was listening to that, and then uh, you could kind of switch between the ones that you needed. So for that one, I set it up as a homework, which is I've, I've seen a lot of people kind of playing around back and forth on the homework, and then that, that way it wasn't the one that where I'd, I didn't have to like move it for kids and stuff. They could work at their own pace. So I think that, that that helped out for listening assessments quite a bit. Um, I know that a lot of the features that are on Nearpod are ones, like I said, that, that have been um, present in other programs before. But I've just found that like, in terms of usability, accessibility, for me personally, I'm not the most tech savvy person. Like I said, I'm a technology hoarder. I've got like, just about every issue with technology that anybody can have. I get frustrated really quickly. And uh, Nearpod is one that I just, it, it just kind of made sense to me. Um, and like I've been able to give formative assessments on a daily basis and then uh, easily enter grades. If you have like a multiple choice test, it just does all the grading for you. All you do is just go look through the list and then put them all in. So that's Nearpod. Um, there's a couple other things that uh, I was gonna talk to you guys about too. And one of them I, I'm unfortunately not able to uh, get a really good to get my app working for it right now. I'm thinking that, that it's something with my, with my iPad. I've, my iPad has just been collecting dust ever since we got Chromebooks, so it's one of those things. Um, but has anybody in here heard of Jamtalk before? J-A-M-T-O-K? Uh, this is like mainly, I think, an iPad thing, so I think this is only going to apply to a few people, so I'm going to make this pretty brief. But I want you guys to know, like, Jamtalk is kind of like, I, I explain it to my kids, and uh, I, I wouldn't say this is 100% true, but it's kind of like Guitar Hero for learning, learning Spanish. So uh, it's got popular songs that you can play about 20 seconds of unless you start either paying your own money or playing the game a lot. So it has that, that, that thing. But uh, um, when I had classroom sets of iPads, you all that have iPads, does anybody have a classroom set? Mm, yes? Okay. So with classroom sets of iPads, when you have six classes that are all playing the, the songs, you actually start unlocking things, which is kind of cool. And so we, yeah, we were trying to unlock all the different uh, songs. So basically what uh, Jam Talk is, is it's, is it's pop songs that have been like translated into Spanish and then performed. So we'll just try watching this video here. I think it does have audio. Um, 
thought it was going to be a video. All right, maybe we won't, because I'm not really 100% sure what that is. Isn't that supposed to, when I click play on that, it's supposed to be playing. All right. Whatever. Anyway, I, uh, just in, to try to make this applicable to the most people as possible, since there's very few of us that have iPads, if, you, if you're interested in Jam Talk, I would, I would really suggest that you download it on your, own, on your own device and then check it out that way. Um, because the other thing that I'm going to talk about, Shobi, is applicable to anyone um, where you've got computers or anything like that. So I'm showing you right now my, my Shobi. So, um, and it's on the, the, the name of it is on, on the agenda here, Shobi, S-H-O-W-B-I-E. If you just go to Shobi.com. You'll need to create an account and stuff like that. And I found that it was actually really easy to do. And then to make my different classes, all that I had to do was um, like just, this is kind of what it'll look like, I think, at the beginning. And you'll just click on this little gear, and you click New Class. And all you got to do is just title it. That's, that's all you put in is just the title. And then once you've got that class, um, you'll be able to add assignments to it. And this is something that there is a paid version of, but I don't pay for it. This, I, I use this for free. And this is how we do videos in class. I do a speaking assessment. And so you'll be able to see here um, that there's a shared folder. And in that shared folder, if I, post a, if I post something in the shared folder, that means that every kid who's logged in here can see it. OK? <laughs> So, and just to show you guys, this is the description of what they were supposed to do. So, this is a conversation, and it was showing them their rubric, um, and it basically was covering all the different topics we did for Capitulo Preliminar and Avancemos. They were to upload their videos, and I've got, I mean, their videos, all they do is just pretty much, okay, so apparently she wanted me to watch this one, not the other one, but the... Uh, the, the students upload their videos there. And the thing that this does is, has anybody in here tried to actually have students like send you videos for a project in your email? It's a nightmare. I tried that. It's a nightmare. It sucks. Um, you end up with, with things not coming through. You can't send certain sizes. What Shobi does is it's, it's like, this is my class. I can go through. I can grade all of them. And, and it makes grading really easy. And uh, to watch the video, all you do is just click on it. So um, that's something that's really easy for students to do. To, to give you an idea of what students would see, um, I believe it looks pretty much the same as what it looks like for me, only they don't have this like add a grade <laughs> button. So instead, they just if you click on that, you can add something from your computer. And if you click on this other one, you add something from Google Drive. For Chromebooks, we have to save everything to our Google Drive because we don't really have storage on the devices they can use. Um, anyway, though, they'll, they'll just use another program. We've been using Wii Video to record the, um, the videos, and it's, it's worked pretty, pretty easy because Wii Video is just, I mean, I don't have them actually editing or anything, um, but they just will save that video, make sure it's on their Google Drive, and then upload it here. Um, you can use this not only for videos, you can also use it for like documents and stuff. This is just another way to make your classroom paperless. So that is Shobi. So between Nearpod and Shobi, uh, like these are kind of the tools that I use on a daily basis. With Nearpod, I, or I use it almost every single day that I teach now. And with, uh, with Shobi, I use it every time I do an assessment that involves a video. Um, if I was, were to assign a worksheet, I could post it, post a PDF, and they could um, write on that PDF and then turn it in the same way. Uh, so there's a lot more clicking than just you know, shuffling through papers. So I don't, I don't generally assign that too much. But um, I just some of the ways that you can use devices to help your classroom become paperless and also integrate more other features of technology using Nearpod. Um, like I said, they're organized other places. So does anybody have any particular questions or comments or anything that you'd like to share, ask me now? Yeah, we don't use Google Classroom. We use Converge instead of Google Classroom. Okay, but yeah. That took the place of... OK, yeah, yeah. The question was, um, does Shobi take the place of Google Classroom? And the answer that I would have is, is kind of, yeah. It's, 
I mean, you're, you're uploading things from your Google Drive. So I'm not all too experienced with Google Classroom because we pretty much, our, our, our administration said, no, we're going to do like Converge, um, which is like a different LMS. And uh, kids have had a lot of issues with, with that one. And this is the one that I use on the iPads. So it, it, it just kind of worked for me. There's probably a lot of things you could do on Google Classroom you could do on Shobi too. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yep. Thanks, Lacey. Any other questions, comments? Anything from the feed? No. I just have a comment about Nearpod, and that's been a challenge for our teachers to, for me to try to um, sell them, I guess, on using it. And all of your examples were, were excellent, and I think it's one of those things that for, for at least some of the teachers that I've worked with, it's been a challenge to get it set up, but I, once they start, they love it. So if, if anybody's questioning whether it's worth the time, I think it's great. Thank you. Thank you. And you guys have actually used Nearpod in the past then? Or? We have an English teacher that... Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I, we have an English teacher that had a challenging, um, I don't know, something with it. They were doing an English class. Anyway, uh, they had partners, so there was a lot of collaboration between the two. Uh, so they had one iPad for every two people. And then the next day, she had done a similar lesson, and they all had their individual iPads. And they stopped discussing. They stopped everything. So she went back to having one for every two because of the collaboration that was done among the students. And, um, and also with that, she noticed that it didn't matter high level, low level, maybe some behavior issues and things like that. Everybody was on task. She's, she was just so impressed. And the formative assessments and then later the summative assessments spoke very, I mean, reinforced everything that Nearpod, I mean, it was a great, anyway, great tool. So anyway, I think it's, it was very impressive. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I've noticed the same sort of thing. Because I didn't always use Nearpod. It was something I, I adopted within the last couple of years here. In the first couple of years, yeah, it was like my, my assessments were a lot lower. Um, especially, you would see more of an achievement gap than I'm seeing now. And, and also, like, it just helped me to organize everything. Because I knew, like, I knew what question was the hard one or, you know, whatever topic it was that I maybe didn't cover enough for that class. So, and I kind of have competitions between classes now because I, I write up their percentages, you know, and it's like they know, they, they know how their entire class is doing. So it, it just makes those results really easily available. She talked a little bit about the creation process. So, I mean, you guys have seen what it looks like to actually use the program. So what does it look like when you create might be a good a thing to just take a look at here. Um, so here on my screen, I'll go ahead and pull it up. So when you get a Nearpod into Nearpod, you'll just be looking at this and probably you'll start actually with this. And you can actually download other people's Nearpods first. They're, they're, they call them NPPs, Nearpod P presentation. I don't know what the P stands, the second P stands for. Anyway, um, or maybe it's NP. Okay, that's probably what it is. Anyway, uh, the My Library is where you've got your stuff, um, meaning if you've already created something, you can like post it there. Uh, you can join into other people's by clicking join. Exploring is how you can like get on. They have like a whole shop where you can purchase other things. I've actually never purchased a Nearpod um, as long as I've had it. The and then reports is where you can also take a look at results and be able to enter them in based on like participation and stuff. I find that reports work well for like when I went down and did like a formative assessment entering in grades as long as I didn't have any quizzes like I said I'm a hoarder I end up with like like I, I have like eight quizzes on the same one I only gave four of them in that class period so so like <laughs> the percentages were all off because of that but um, anyway to show you guys I'm gonna click on create here and this is just what it did, did is it automatically started me into a presentation untitled presentation so and uh, you just will start adding slides. And one thing I found is uh, I actually always make a PowerPoint presentation. Oh, there's my fantasy team. Left more points on the bench than I actually scored last week. It was pretty sad. Um, I always have a PowerPoint. It's one of these. So I always make a PowerPoint with all my content, and then whenever I want to transfer it over to Nearpod, I just take a screenshot of it, and then I can upload it. Uh, I can do that. Okay. So the way that you do that is uh, on, on Macs, it's Command-Shift-3. 
four, and then that gives you this little crosshair. And then you can like drag however much you want, or you can click escape if you don't want to take a screenshot anymore. And uh, you'll get the screenshot. I have it so it just automatically pops up on my desktop. So that makes me even more of a hoarder because I'll end up with like 50 different screenshots I've taken. And uh, add as a slide. If you just want it to be regular with nothing on it, you can add image. You can actually add images and audio, and you can add text to it. Um, Nearpod itself does not really have the features that PowerPoint does for like text editing and stuff. So I don't know why I clicked on that. Yes, yes, you can. I have personally not had good luck with that because of the formatting. I don't know if it's gotten a little bit better. Yeah, where like I got my entire PowerPoint done, and then it'll like it just drops it all in there, and it'll be like a normal slide. Um, so, so what she had said was you can actually just save like upload your entire PowerPoint um, without having to take screenshots and stuff, and uh, that's that's very true. And I've I've had that work a couple of times, and I've also had it where where the text didn't pop up right, which they might have worked on a little bit. Um, anyway, this is actually a loner computer mine. Mine went a little bit haywire, so it just seems like it goes a little bit slower. But if I find that screenshot, which I think it's 1011, so I can upload that one that I took. I can add audio to it if I want to, um, and I can clear it and stuff. So the that's just a basic one. Uh, but just to give you guys an idea here, if you just even if you're just making a brand new slide, you just click here, kind of in between your slides, or click Add Slide, and it shows you the different types of content. So um, you can add just a regular slide, video, audio. Slideshow is when you've got several different things, uh, several different slides that kids can select between. Field trip is that 360 thing that has the weird, you can like look around. Um, a PDF viewer I've not used all too much, but I imagine that's just to make, make it easier for you to upload a PDF. Web content is when you just add in the URL. Twitter stream, you put in your Twitter handle and it'll pop up to whatever your Twitter handle is. Activities, oops. So those are the different just types of content that you can add activities like the polls, the quizzes are the ones where it's multiple choice, uh, draw it is where you can have a slide and then your, your kids are drawing or adding text boxes. Fill in the blanks is where you've got the vocabulary where you can like kind of drag it around. Matching pairs, I thought this sounded exciting and no, it's, it's memory. That's what it is. It's memory. It creates two identical things in your kids. Yeah, it's, I think it's for kindergarten. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and then open-ended questions are just where you have kids type. So, um, the cool thing about open-ended questions, though, if any of us has ever tried, you know, just like getting a, a a response from the entire class, it organizes everything they've said all in a row. So you can just, you know, ask a question, they answer it. You can see people's, and you can just kind of pick the interesting answers out, so you can get more practice. Because if we've ever, you know, ever like given out little slips of paper to ask one or two questions, gotten them all in, and you're like, well, hold on, while I try to find the interesting ones, the ones people actually cared about. So um, it just does a good job organizing that. Uh, that's how how the the uh, creation aspect of it goes. I take a lot of screenshots um, on my on my computer. Sometimes it'll be like quiet in in the in like the PLC, and they hear like the shutter click on my screen and they're like, what's he doing? And yeah, usually making a lesson. Sometimes I'm taking selfies too. I like, I like taking selfies. Can I ask a question about the two um, codes that you put up there? You said one was self-paced and one was teacher-paced? Yeah, they Can call it that? homework. So this uh, second one was homework, which you can actually assign things as homework then. Um, and I found that a lot of kids had some, some issues, you know, and I guess, they, the, let's put it like this. What I found when I assigned something as homework was the higher achievers had excuses and the lower achievers didn't do it. <laughs> so there was, uh, there was like issues, I guess, with um, that they would like send it in and then it wouldn't get saved. But uh, one thing I found that, that with, with the homework is that kids, if they just have that code, like if I have Google, Google Classroom, and I share, you know, with, with my entire class this Nearpod code, then they can, like, you know, have all that information. Um, and, and maybe that was something that I just dealt with that was a result of our, like, sort of internet issues that we were having. Um, but 
you've got two different things. So this one, the teacher manipulates what slide you're on. So if I want you on this slide, you're on this slide. When we move over, you're on this slide. Homework means you could be on this slide, and then this person over here could be on this slide. Everybody's on their own slide. And so I use different ones for different tools within the classroom. And you actually could assign homework using that, though I personally have not had the best of luck with it. But I've also basically just gave it a college try. So does that answer the question? Thank you. All right. Um, I, there's a lot of stuff to take in here. I'm going to let you guys unpack it all between the last presentation. Oh, oh, yes. I have two questions that are kind of related, but I'll wait for the mic to get here so you don't yell at me. <laughs> so we have two questions here. I have two questions that might be related, so I'm going to ask them both at the same time. Sure. So you said that you would pay for this Nearpod service. So my first question is why. The second question is, do you have to provide that code to your students every time you do a lesson? Or since you paid for it, you don't have to do that anymore? OK, uh, good questions. So first question was about the paying part of it. So there's a trial with Nearpod, and that's what I started on. But the trial severely limits how many Nearpod presentations you have. If you are thinking that you might use Nearpod for a lesson here or there, don't pay for it. It's not worth your money. Um, it's like $10 a month, and they've got specials that come up seemingly around Black Friday every year. But uh, I wouldn't pay for it in that case. Now, um, <clears throat> the, the difference is not just in, OK, so the differences are, are kind of twofold. First of all, the amount of storage you get and the amount of uh, presentations you can have published. So I think they only let you have like five or six presentations published, um, which you can actually kind of manipulate that, I believe, if you just keep unpublishing your old presentations, which just takes time. Um, so I mean, you, could, you can even find a way to manipulate that if you, if you think you'd be like a regular user. Um, the other thing is there are certain features, namely the exterior, like, like the Twitter stream and the internet, um, and I believe even video are not available to the, to the, the free user. Um, but they are available during your like free trial period. So they'll, they'll let you see how cool it is. And then like, you know, next lesson you try to do it. And they're like, it doesn't work anymore. That's the difference between paid and free. The other question was about, does that, does that answer that question? OK. Um, the other question was about this code. And yes, you do have to enter to give them that code at the start of every class. I like this because. We're learning the alphabet every time I do that. So from the very beginning, that's kind of how I teach them the alphabet. I don't really have like a, like a A, B, C, D for the entire, you know, the, the, where we just, just do alphabet. Um, it's just it's a, every single day, eventually, you're going to learn some of the, you know, those like, and when this one comes up, it's like, I know Equis, and Equis is probably going to be screwed up by about half the people. But that's why I, I say the code, let them all try to enter it in, and I get like half the kids are like, C, and then so many of the kids are like, oh, I didn't get it. I don't know what that is. So I've got then write it up on the board. Um, the way the reason that this is is it organizes it based on your classes. So it kind of has an automatic way. You don't you don't title the classes or anything, but you'll have like six different classes. Like for me, I teach six hours, so there will be six different classes. Each one was a different Nearpod code. And that way, when I go through and enter grades, I don't have like 153. That are all on the same list. I've got you know my my 29, my 30 kids. Our class sizes went up when we did the freshman academy, so I've got a big big group of kids. But um, that was that's uh, the Nearpod codes, and you will need to enter those each time. Shobi actually has codes as well, and I don't think I really I didn't go into Shobi <laughs> all that much. I mean, as one of those things, I think it's very similar to Google Classroom, like Lacey was saying. Um, but you'll just give them the code once. So that's that. Like once they're in the class, they're in the class. For this, like. My presentations are like, as, once I finish a presentation, um, I click Publish, which is down here in the corner. Now, let's see if, yeah, oh, darn, it has to have at least two slides on it. Um, but you click Publish, and then I can actually start sharing it with the class. So once I'm done creating uh, Nearpod, then I click Publish, and now it's available for me to share um, either as homework, where kids will paste themselves and be able to work with their own, you know, whatever slide they want. Or as like a teacher guided, you know, like essentially kind of, like I said, PowerPoint on steroids thing. Does that answer all of your questions? Yes, it does. Thank you. Right. Thank you.
Sweet. I know a lot of people are already like, you know, just exploring different things from the different sessions that you guys have talked about. Um, I'm available for any more questions. Do you have something to add from the feed? No. Okay. Um, let's give Joe a great round of applause, if you would, please. <laughs> Wonderful job. Thank you so much.